joint uh, meeting of the State Capital Committee and the Capital Campus Design Advisory Committee to hear uh, the Ruckelshaus report on the uh, capital aid situation assessment. Um, the uh, members of the uh, uh, State Capital Committee that are with us is Kelly Wicker from the Gov Governor Inslee's designee, Ken Rasky, Assistant Secretary uh, for Representative uh, or uh, excuse me, for Secretary uh, Wyman, Commissioner Peter Goldmark, and myself, uh, the Honorable Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we would also like to welcome members of the Capital uh, Campus Design Advisory Committee, uh, Susan Olmstead, welcome, Jonathan Taylor, Senator Frazier, and Representative McKeown. Well, and uh, let me just say uh, this, uh, I have been uh, serving on uh, this committee for 18 years. Uh, and I have been incredibly impressed by uh, the commitment that all of you have made to uh, this work uh, for the Capitol, and uh, we appreciate it very, very much. And I'm sure I always agree with you 100%. <laughs> That's not good. Anyway, uh, thank you for what you for what you do. Um, and you, you should know that Senator Frazier does a great job of seeing that your views are well, well known and that in the committee as she attends. Um, the, uh, uh, the agenda was published in the, uh, in the Olympian, and uh, public comment will be heard during a, uh, a section of the agenda for public comment. And if you have not signed up, I believe there's a sign-up sheet uh, for people to sign up. We will get to as many of you as we can uh, we would ask that if you are uh, with a group, that possibly you ask a, a, a person to represent you in order to allow as many different uh, uh, voices to be heard, uh, <coughs> opinions to be heard. If you're not able to testify, because we will have to end at noon, um, uh, you will be uh, given the opportunity to submit comment um, through the uh, website. Uh, Bonnie, can you tell us how that how that works? That's the how, website? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, uh, what what the website is? Sure, it's the DES website. Mm -hmm. It's just the general in internet website, and there'll be a link. It'll probably be on the facilities page, and there'll be a link uh, where you can get to the report, and we'll set something up for the will be comments that will be able to be posted. Okay. Okay. With that, we're going to move uh, uh, right into. Um, to the program, and Bonnie uh, Shield, Acting Assistant Director of the Department of Enterprise Services, will provide the opening comments. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Owen. I would like to thank you all for coming together for this historic joint SCC and CDAC meeting today. The joint meeting provides a setting for the committee to build a common foundation of knowledge to support their ongoing work regarding the future of Capital Lake Basin. The agenda item today is an opportunity to hear findings from the William D. Ruckels House Center on the outcome of their recent situation assessment on the management of Capital Lake. In June of 2014, Enterprise Services contract contacted the Ruckels House Center to provide a situation assessment around Capital Lake management. Over the past several months, the center has conducted interviews with community leaders and interested parties to help determine the most productive means of addressing the issues around the Capital Lake Basin and its future management. The report will be finalized the week of December 15th on our internet. And um, with that, I'll give it back to you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, representing the uh, uh, Ruckles House Center will be Michael Kern, who will provide a short introduction to the uh, William D. Ruckles House Center. And then a discussion of the findings will be presented by Chris Page and Christina Sanders. Do I have that correct? You do. Michael, you're on. Great. Um, and please let me know if the microphone is too far away and you know, not close enough. The, uh, at the table or in the audience, the universal symbol for I can't hear you is, is great. And, um, and I'll, I'll try and talk louder or, or uh, be closer. But we really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much to both committees um, for coming together uh, for a special um, meeting um, for our findings. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Michael Kern, the director of the William D. Ruckles House Center. Chris Page is a uh, project and development lead at the center. Christina Sanders is the associate director of Washington State University's Division of Governmental Studies and Services. And uh, the center assembles teams of faculty, staff, 
students and practitioners affiliated with both universities, and her division is a common partner for us uh, because of the overlap with their expertise and the kind of work that we do. So um, uh, Chris and Christina were the two uh, principal, um, uh, I guess, investigators on uh, this situation assessment. Um, we only have, uh, oh, I also want to mention we have a project assistant, uh, Raquel Espinoza, in the room who uh, was, uh, uh, those of you who were interviewed for this uh, probably heard from Raquel, uh, and, and she did uh, great work, so wanted her to be able to be here today. We only have about a dozen slides for you, so uh, you don't have to worry that you're going to be sitting and staring at slides for a really long time. Uh, our understanding of the time we've got, we hope to do our part in about 15 minutes, so there's about 15, 20 minutes for questions, and you know there's public comments at the end. Um, we rec we you know, recommend saving questions for the end of our 15 minutes and dozen slides, but it's at your preference. Feel free to uh, interrupt if there's things that you want to ask as we move along. And uh, we do have some handouts on the back table, uh, a one-pager on the center, uh, a copy of these slides uh, with room to take notes if you want to do that. Um, and then I think also a list of interviewees. So if you're uh, interested in that, th those can be passed around. You can, I can see some people are taking the opportunity to, to get those slides. I will try and remember to um, move the slides along. Uh, what's that? I'm happy to do the clicker. If you want. Oh, that's fine. Um, so the mission of the Ruckles House Center is to foster collaborative public policy in the state of Washington and the Pacific Northwest. We're named for our founder and advisory board chair. We're devoted to his approach to collaborative problem solving. We are a joint effort, as I mentioned, of Washington's two research universities, and we're, uh, we were developed in response to requests from community leaders. We're hosted at the UW side by the Daniel J. Evans School of Public Affairs, uh, on the WSU side by WSU Extension. And as I mentioned, there is a one-pager that provides uh, more information about the center. The center responds where involvement by the universities adds uh, value, makes the prospects for a successful outcome more likely. Our services are shown on the slide above me. I'm not going to read through them, but they basically add up to the toolkit of conflict resolution, collaborative policy making, sometimes called alternative dispute resolution. Uh, in academic circles, people like the term collaborative governance. Uh, you can choose whichever one you like. We have a set of project criteria to guide an assessment of the appropriateness of our involvement in a given policy situation. And those primary criteria uh, that we apply are, are listed above. We also have secondary criteria. Um, the, if, if you think there's a situation uh, where the center might be able to be of assistance, we really encourage you to contact us so that we can apply these criteria. Every once in a while we end up getting an assignment that isn't really a good fit for us, and if we talk with you about it in advance, we can help suss that out so that we can provide you the assistance you need, or if we don't make sense, we can steer you in the right direction. I want to make the distinction between the assessment we do of, the, uh, of, of whether a project is appropriate for us, and this, this assessment uh, which is a, a specifically an assessment about uh, the opportunities for a collaborative process on Capitol Lake. Um, so because they're both uh, use the word assessment, I don't want to I don't want to make that confusing. Uh, and that's really all I want to say in terms of introducing the center um, and and our process. I want to turn it over to uh, these two members of our project team. Uh, Christina is going to cover the purpose and the approach and methods for the uh, situation assessment that we did. And then Chris will describe preliminary findings uh, and recommendations. We're all available for Q&A, and as mentioned, the report will be finalized next week. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris, or Christina. Yeah. How many do you Yeah, that'd be great. Because right. I didn't play with that piece Good morning, all, and thank you very much for having us here this morning. So the slide that's up there basically has, in a nutshell, um, the purpose of the assessment. And I'm just going to do a kind of a quick overview of the approach. So in the 2011 through 2013 capital budget, the Washington State Legislator, Legislature appropriated $200,000 to DES to begin the process of seeking necessary permits to dredge and spot dredge excess sediments as required under the proposed long-term management strategies. In addition to that permit seeking process, DES contracted with the William D. Ruckles House Center to conduct the situation assessment. A situation assessment generally is an interview based effort to better understand and explore the relevant issues and interests of involved parties along with the situation dynamics. Uh, this type of assessment typically is a first step in exploring the potential for a collaborative process and reveals useful information to guide the next steps forward whether or not that might involve a collaborative process. 
If the parties to a collaborative process reach an agreement, results typically are returned to a traditional legislative, executive, and or a judicial policy forum for consideration and possible action. The structured interviews that we conducted including, included interests from architecture, business, citizens or residents in the area, federal government, local government, elected officials, local government staff, marine businesses, media, NGOs, state government elected officials, state government staff, and tribal government staff. Interviewees were selected based on a set of criteria to ensure balance and represent, representation. The goal being that everyone feels that their interests are represented, whether or not they themselves were interviewed. And interviews were conducted according to um, our WSU's University Human Subjects Review uh, protocols. Um, important to note that this was not a basin-wide assessment for the Deschutes watershed, um, and that it was not a thorough analysis of all management options. The report will be a synthesis of what we heard, it explores the issues and interests of the involved parties along with situation dynamics, and it's really designed to guide next steps moving forward. So just a um, quick overview on, the, overview on the methodology. So um, uh, as, a, as a research team, the, those of us at the Ruckles House Center and me at DGSS did some background research um, developed an appropriate approach for moving forward and developed the initial list of interviewees um, and conducted some preliminary issue identification. Then we um, conducted interviews with 44 parties um, from the interests that I mentioned earlier. And the report basically will articulate major issues and the key parties involved, documents their interests and perspectives, and analyzes and explores again the processes for um, or prospects for a collaborative process to address those issues. So the interviews were conducted between August and almost all the way through the end of November and um, then were used to develop the information that went into to the report. So um, I'll turn it over to Chris now and he'll talk to us a little bit more about findings. Thanks, Christina, and thanks to the members of the committee for having us. Thanks to DES for allowing us to take this on. To give a little context, the management of Capital Lake and the Deschutes River Basin has many of the hallmarks of a complex public policy challenge. Multiple organizations and individuals with vastly different and passionate views and priorities. A set of local issues weighted with history and politics. Several government agencies with diverse management responsibilities and natural hydrological sediment processes exacerbating environmental pressures. This is compounded by a factor nearly every person contacted during this assessment cited as a major issue, serious lack of discretionary funds in the state operating budget. This assessment was conducted to synthesize all the major viewpoints on related issues, to analyze the prospects for a collaborative process to seek agreement, and to recommend potential next steps. It did reveal some reason for optimism despite the litany of challenges. Several areas of agreement emerged that might serve as a starting point for either collaborative dialogue or other steps forward. Nearly all participants in this process are frustrated enough with the status quo that there appears to be widespread motivation to undertake the hard work it will take to develop and agree on a long-term plan that is politically and economically viable. First, I would like to describe the areas of agreement and disagreement, starting with areas of agreement. This assessment revealed a set of outcomes or interests that are desired by sizable constituencies. It may be the case that not all the parties hold all of these as desired outcomes, but it is likely that everyone involved can acknowledge that any given interest I'm about to describe is important to others. These elements of a stable solution could be a starting point for a collaborative dialogue to identify and agree on common interests, which is a key step in collaborative agreement seeking. And all right, so the first bullet, though they had different ideas on how to do it, people agreed that environmental values are important to uphold. Five specific environmental values people support, good water quality, healthy fish and wildlife habitat, long-term sediment management, plan that comes with a cost sharing strategy, invasive species management, and consideration of the impacts of land and river management at a full watershed scale. It's important to note that in interviewees on all sides of the central issues support the basin-wide or watershed scale for management considerations. 
Second bullet, social and cultural, four major areas of agreement or elements of a stable solution. Aesthetics, we heard from lots of people, the appearance of the reflecting pool and the aesthetics of the area are important to a lot of people. Recreational, interviewees also said they value walking, jogging, swimming, boating, and fishing, which is sort of related but maybe considered different. Lots of people hope that fishing opportunities can be an eventual, uh, an amenity of the eventual outcome, or the eventual long-term solution. Cultural and social cohesion is something we heard a desire related to that, to bridge perceived divisions in the community. There's perceptions of the pro-Lake factions as a certain segment of Olympia and pro-estuary as another. Some saw a divide between state agencies and local residents. And people spoke of the desire to build bridges between tribal and non-tribal residents of the area. On the third bullet, it has to be financially feasible now in the long term. People also said they wanted a long-term solution that supported tourism and downtown businesses. We also heard equity related to the uh, cost sharing, and that could be considered a social cultural value as well. But um, whatever long-term management option is, cho is chosen will cost money that is not currently available. Federal funding may be available depending on the path forward. We heard support for a potential local funding district and local governance structure to help manage the system. Across the board, though, people desire a healthy local economy, and they support cost sharing to help handle sediment management. Under health and safety, a couple to mention. Flood control was mentioned. Lots of people cited flood control. This needs to be taken into account into a long-term management plan. And those who mentioned they wanted swimming and fishing, swimmable and fishable waters mean healthy waters. That's a health issue as well. Now to the differences. No surprise, we found a significant divide between those who want to keep the lake and those who want to restore the estuary. Folks who spoke directly to this polarization often voiced the opinion that most issues could be agreed on except for removing the dam. The second bullet, the Department of Ecology's water quality model regarding the dam's impact on dissolved oxygen and bud inlet has been questioned, and most of you probably know this has been high profile. It's an issue with very different perceptions, accusations of misinformation, and some saying in this assessment that state agencies are biased in favor of the estuary in terms of how they're doing the science and the fact finding. Moving on to the third bullet, and there's three subsections there. Most folks who mentioned aesthetics tended to do so in the context of how picturesque the lake is, while others assert, though, that the title ebb and flow have a beauty of their own, and people mentioned that 80% of the time the estuary area would be underwater and provide the reflection, reflection of the capital that's so prized. Economics, people differed both on how much they thought overall costs would be of the long-term management options, along with the economic impact on the downtown businesses. Some think a lake would benefit the economy more, while others point to the restored Nisqually estuary as a large tourist attraction. Recreation, many said the lake provides superior recreational benefits, but again on this, some, a smaller number pointed to the restored Nisqually estuary for the recreational opportunities that provides as well. On the fourth bullet, despite the polarization I mentioned, most expressed some optimism for a collaborative process. Not, just about 90% of the 44 people that we talked to thought it would be appropriate at this time. Although, it should be said that those who are skeptical were really skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Several interviewees said they thought the clamp process was already an attempt at collaboration. They said, we've been there and we've done that. I'll talk more about that in a moment. The views on who might be at the table for a potential collaborative process differed widely. Some thought it should be a wide open public process or that a wide net should be cast to include interested parties, while others think it should be limited to the various levels of government entities. I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment, too. For next steps, um, the synthesizing what we heard in this assessment, it would be important to resolve the dispute around modeling the dam's impact on water quality and bud inlet. A couple of potential paths were su suggested state could commission an independent scientific review of the Department of Ecology's computer models of the di this dynamic. Could potentially be conducted by an academic faculty, provided their participation is deemed acceptable by all involved parties. 
The ecology technical staff, oh, here's another path. The ecology technical staff and the outside scientists who have questioned their, who has questioned their computer model could continue to meet. They did meet once or twice this fall to see if it's possible to refine the calibrations of the model such that these parties are in agreement about the validity of the findings. It might make sense to commission an independent reviewers and possibly a third party facilitator to participate in those meetings. About a collaborative process. Some people that we talked to in this assessment said that they thought the CLAMP process was biased toward a predetermined outcome and voiced or voiced other criticisms. It will be important to conduct any future collaboration in a way that addresses those concerns. If a new process with the CLAMP entities, you all know what that is? Do I need to spell that out? Mm -hmm. Capital Lake Adaptive Management Program met from 1997 to 2009 with nine government entities, including four state agencies and local governments. And tribe. What? And tribe. And tribe. Yeah. Thank you. If a new process with the CLAMP entities operates the same as the last one, it would be subject to the same criticisms. In synthesizing what we heard, the chances of a collaborative effort would succeeding would be highest if those government entities consider new potential options or approaches to capture those agreed on a set of agreed on elements of a sustainable solution with the active input from the public and their constituencies and a facilitator regarded as neutral by all the parties the goals of a potential collaborative process could be to develop and evaluate one or more of the potential hybrid solutions, what we heard from interviewees was that there might be a way to revisit the, what was called the dual basin estuary in the CLAMP effort, which people didn't not tend to think highly of as an option as it was considered by CLAMP, but they thought it might be worth looking at some new approaches to trying to capture the benefits of both the lake and the estuary with either a spatial split, but maybe not as a uh, complicated or expensive a divider has the clamp process looked at or potentially a temporal split where there might be tide gates that allow for open estuary flow and processes for certain times of the year or certain time periods and those tide gates could be raised to create the basin and reflecting pool at other times <coughs> So those two options would be what we mean when we talk about hybrid solutions. That process would, should be open to any other approach that would satisfy the majority of the agreed upon common interest though, as it says on the slide. That process could also identify uh, possible additional actions upstream, land and river management strategies and policies, as well as the impacts downstream to bud the inlet in terms of sediment management and water quality and other dynamics. It could potentially engage other entities that share the Deschutes Basin that could possibly help with funding and management. That process could identify the data and science questions necessary to be answered to accurately evaluate any emerging options on the table or update the knowledge base on existing options. People said it would be important, in fact vital, to identify fact-finding entities that it would be acceptable to all the parties, not just the clamp governmental entities but the NGOs and stakeholders. We heard that having the clamp entities at the table directly serves multiple functions. It utilizes an already extant mechanism. Although defunded, it was not disbanded, according to interviewees. It would provide the opportunity for widespread public engagement via the representative governments. It ensures the decision-making entities are directly involved. It would also enable the consideration of a local funding and taxing district. I'll say a little bit more about that. It also supplies the forum for government-to-government -government interactions that are vital to the tribes. Interviewees th think the chances of success would be highest if the process had some of these characteristics or had the following characteristics. And some of these echo a little bit of the above, what I've already said. To begin with a shared vision, those elements of a stable solution or a clear, a, at least a, a shared vision, a clear definition of how decisions are made and of what constitutes consensus. Uh, focusing on the potential to capture the amenities of both the lake and estuary, a strong base of agreed upon factual information, preceded if necessary by a fact-finding effort done through an entity acceptable to all parties. Acknowledgement that a clamp collaboration has already occurred in structuring the new process to avoid the, <coughs> avoid the criticism voiced about clamp. For example, the data, different data collectors, broader geographic scope, 
maybe even a different name or acronym. A core group of the CLAMP entities. <laughs> CLAMP's um, not the most collaborative acronym out there. <laughs> just, to, just saying. A core group of the CLAMP entities, um, though, could t um, be proactive about channeling public, in, uh, public input through their individual governments. We heard proactive public engagement by those governments would be important to ensure citizen and stakeholder input. It would be good to have active participation or open liaison work with the agencies from whom dredging permits would be required early and along the way. The potential inclusion of or consultation with other public services, such as the Lot Clean Water Alliance, Lacey Olympia, Tumwater Thurston. Conversations am among these entities about cost sharing strategy and a funding mechanism for long term management of the sediment, infrastructure, and other anticipated areas of capital expenditure. This could take the form of what one respondent proposed as a Deschutes River Basin Management District. And that's the third slide on recommendations. This is a standalone one, even though I mentioned it under the collaboration slide, since it could be undertaken independent of a group process that's focused on a specific management plan, though ideally those would be informing or are together. People agree on the need for a funding mechanism and on a cost sharing strategy for long term management of the sediment infrastructure and other anticipated areas of expenditure. This could also address some of what we heard as a disconnect between the state having management responsibility, but local residents being most directly and significantly impacted. People said, should cost for managing this feature of downtown Olympia really be borne by people in Spokane or Tri Cities? One theme we heard in this assessment over and over was someone needs to step up and make a decision. <laughs> to wrap this process up, um, we do plan to send a courtesy copy of our draft report by the end of the week, so by the end of the day tomorrow, a courtesy copy to interviewees for them to identify any factual inaccuracies. We want to vet our findings. Mm. It's just about a dozen pages. A lot of you are in this room. So you're looking, you can look forward to receiving that. And we'll look forward to hearing your comments. We'll give you a deadline to respond by. We'll give you at least two or three business days. Um, we do have to revise and finalize the report next week, so a week from tomorrow. And it'll be in DES's hands by December 19th. Can I just say something real quick about the courtesy copies? Just to clarify, you know, it's an, ac it's an independent academic report. It's not a, you know, it's not a government document. It's not a, um, it's not a decision-making document, so it's not a public comment period. We're not looking for people to, you know, go over it with a fine-tooth comb and, and come back to us and, and try to it, it influence us or get us to change the substance of what we're saying. We want it, but we want the folks who we interviewed to look at it and say, for factual inaccuracies, is that, did we just get something wrong? Did we mishear something? Did we, did we forget something? So that, that's the purpose of the review. So that was a little longer than 15 minutes, but we do have some time for Q&A. I think okay. for the members, questions? Anybody? So I do have a question. I, I can ask you in here for Secretary Wyman. So I think I heard you say that there is an opportunity for consensus in this whole process, although we're not obviously there yet. People thought that consensus over dam removal would be very difficult. It's possible there could be consensus on a shared vision or on elements of a stable solution as we're describing these common values that we've identified. It may be more appropriate to attempt to obtain consensus on areas of agreement and map out areas of disagreement, return those findings to the legislature or to these committees to decision making body. Other questions? Sure. Anybody? Commissioner. So have you thought about what that process might look like, its duration, how many meetings, uh, and a timeline? Um, I think no. I mean, I think what the, those very important considerations would be something that would be put in place once you knew exactly which of these different process options that we've articulated the involved parties are interested in pursuing, then those things would logically fall. I think something else that's important to, to, to mention is that while, uh, as Chris described it, there was guarded optimism about some things you could do moving forward collaboratively, um, we always, in our, uh, as part of our project criteria, we evaluate not only is a process ripe for a collaborative approach, but would the, uh, should there be a third party facilitator of that process? And everyone we spoke to said yes, if you're going to 
get people together, they would definitely benefit from having a, a neutral third party in the room. Um, when we apply that to our own project criteria, we ask, um, would the center be an acceptable convener? Because uh, there's lots of different options besides the Rufflesoft Center. And, um, and, and if, if those first two conditions are met, then is there something unique about university involvement? Because we really look for those opportunities where there's something unique about our, our uh, university-based model that would make a successful outcome more likely. We're in a part of the country that, as many of you know, is, is uh, blessed with a lot of private, uh, nonprofit, et cetera, um, sources of, of conflict resolution services. In this case, um, while there was that guarded uh, optimism and reason to believe that, part, that portions or all of this could be addressed with a collaborative approach, the center was not identified as necessarily a good fit um, as the provider. There's, a, there's at least um, uh, uh, one interview that we spoke with, there's, there's folks we spoke with who didn't feel like we were a good fit for that process. Um, and we did not necessarily identify anything about this, aside from maybe some of the technical information-based questions, that really made a university um, model uniquely well suited. So I, I guess our, our suggestion would be that as you move forward, if you, if you do move forward with the collaborative process, we can definitely help you identify um, uh, facilitators, but we're probably not necessarily the right fit for, for doing that work. And it would be, once you get those folks, that would be when you'd sort of suss out. And we can help with that, too, uh, in terms of what the specifics of a process would look like. So back to the original issue you raised, though, and that's part of what this whole process was, I believe, intended to address, and that's the rightness. Yeah. And your assessment of that. So Chris, I'll say a couple things, but it's Chris and Christina are the experts on what they heard. I'll, I'll tell you what I think I heard from them, and then and then ask them to fill in and correct anything that I that I've got wrong. Um, some of the elements are there. Um, it's it's been intractable. It's been going on for a long time. Nobody's getting exactly what they want, um, and uh, and and solutions aren't moving forward. And people are frustrated, and people are saying a decision needs to be made. Um, that's often a, a big precursor of this. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, not everybody is there. Um, there's, there's a concept in our field called BATNA, Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. It's not really much of a point in bringing a process together if everybody who would need to be at the table doesn't think that's the best opportunity they have for getting their interests met. Um, it, it seemed clear to us from this assessment that there are still folks who, uh, the, the CLAMP committee worked for a very long time did very detailed work and came up with options and um, and did forward uh, options. Uh, you know, a preferred alternative. There was a vote. You guys know all the details better than I do. Um, but that hasn't moved forward, and that's an indication that there are entities who have not necessarily enough power to make their preferred outcome happen, but enough to keep, at least for the moment, other outcomes from happening as well. So there is incentive for folks to think about. Uh, what do what do I need to do to get what I want? I probably need to think about what they need, um, and if I can think of a way to do what they to, to address their need, I need to find out what their needs are rather than guess them. And if I find out and there's things I can do to address them without goring my own ox, then um, then we can move forward. And I, so I don't think it's a clean solution. Sometimes we find out like yes, absolutely, everybody's there. Um, that's not necessarily the case here. It's also a unique situation where you're not starting fresh. There's already been, as Chris said, 12 years of a process that's reached a resolution. So it would really probably be designing a, a, a process to try and address the pieces that are stuck, that are keeping it from moving forward, rather than kind of starting with a clean slate. And is that a? I think that's a decent overview. And I would just maybe add that if you're asking if this, pro if this setting is ripe for a collaborative process, most people we talked to said they thought it would be. Um, there are some folks that really think it would depend on how that process were put together, who exactly were sitting at the table, for example. So, Michael, can you tell us again why Ruckelhaus would be the best moving forward uh, from your point of view? Well, I guess two reasons. One, we didn't necessarily see a unique university element, but more importantly, for us to be an effective facilitator, everybody who would need to be part of the solution in order for it to be implemented would need to see us as an acceptable convener. And our assessment indicated that that's not the case, that there's folks who would be more comfortable with a different 
um, facilitator being involved. And we didn't get into the details of why that was. Okay. Um, so you don't have any recommendation at this time for who that might be? Just, for instance, when I hear university and I see all the people here that are interested in this problem, yeah. it seems like there'd be a big research base yeah. uh, component that really may help uh, from the university. And our report will indicate that, that you know, those, those recommendations that Chris had about how to maybe address the remaining technical differences, um, we'll say there's lots of different places you could get that uh, independent review that might help, and universities might be a great place. And, and we may well be in a good position. In fact, I think Chris and Christina have done some preliminary checking at our universities of like who might really be in a good, and I think they found some folks who would be useful, and we would definitely be um, willing to help make those connections and, and, and make that happen. Just, uh, it, it, it's just that our indication, and, and maybe that, you know, uh, if, you, if you start having conversations, maybe you'll find out that even the f folks who, uh, you may get a different answer from people, and in that case, we'd be willing to, we'd certainly be willing to talk to you. But we, um, we wouldn't want to presume to insert ourselves in a process where our um, uh, assessment has indicated that not everybody would be comfortable with us as the facilitator, as the third party. Yes. I'm wondering if the magnitude of the portions of the conflict that have shown to be kind of intractable to use your work mm -hmm. um, are large enough so that the rest of the aspects that seem to have some uh, willingness for negotiation um, would be kind of overrided. That, does that question make sense? It's like, like yeah. a threshold decision about the dam. Is Don't the polarization over the dam a deal breaker? Else, um, yeah. worthwhile talking about? When people talked about the reasons that the pro lake or pro dam uh, parties would like to keep that in place, they cited two things predominantly. One is what was described as an attachment to the lake. So they're just used to having it there. They regard it as a really important feature of downtown or of the capital campus. Um, people talked about the capital campus being world class, so you can think about things like the, just the aesthetics and having it there, the reflection, and people being accustomed to it. So the change would be very difficult. The other piece that people cited over and over was managing the sediment that's got to go out in the butt inlet. So people did support on all, pretty much all sides. Um, the m majority of folks we talked to is support a cost-sharing strategy so the people out in Bud Inlet, the, the port and the mar marina and marine interests, don't have to get stuck with the bill uh, of the sediment impacts there. It was an idea to put in a sediment deflecting wall. So there might be some creative thinking out there in terms of analysis and opportunities to mitigate the sediment management issue. Um, the kind of the, the attachment piece is, you know, that's that's an emotional thing. That's, that's going to challenge a lot of people. But if the benefits of the lake that seem were often cited as really important those aesthetics if there could be some sort of reflecting feature the recreational opportunities if people re said hey this isn't really going to impact our downtown negatively there might be some room for there might be opportunity there those are the big the two big reasons that people said they want to keep the dam the only thing I would add to that is that we we've been involved in situations before and in our careers we've seen lots of situations where um, issues were as polarizing as that issue is in this case. And we've seen them overcome. And, um, and that's not to say that that always happens, but when it does happen, it's because people who are um, strongly advocating a particular approach get to a point where they start saying, um, what do I, there's a recognition that most people are coming from a position of what that I value will I lose if this happens? And if they think they're going to lose things they value, they're going to fight tooth and nail to keep that thing from happening. So if you're on the other side of that issue and you get to a point where you say, what would I have to do to convince them that they're not going to lose that thing they value in order for me to get what I want? Um, then uh, amazing things happen and we've, and we've seen that happen. So there is the possibility for that to happen here. Um, I, I don't know whether it will or not. Senator Frazier. <laughs> Were there other questions? I think we have just a few people <clears throat> that uh, indicate that they may uh, want to uh, uh, testify. Bob, uh, we, one, I always get that wrong. What was that? Did you wish to testify? No, I, I, 
to just uh, I really appreciate the presentation, and we're going to work for the group going forward. Okay. okay. Uh, and let me say this: I wanted to I wanted to mention this before we got started. Uh, most of the people I recognize on on the list uh, here have been involved uh, and shared their opinions over the years on this and have been involved. We appreciate that very much. We very much appreciate that you're here and hope that you will continue to work with us uh, in, in the in the future as well. Uh, John DeMeyer, from Yacht Club, did you wish to uh, make comments? Well, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to participate in this uh, effort. The question I was could, could you come up here. to the microphone please for me so that we could get it uh, 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 on the record I think it would be easier. But I should have said that ahead of time. Thank you very much. And again this is John DeMeyer and you're rep representing the Olympia Yacht Club. Yes and I, I want to thank uh, everybody for the opportunity uh, to participate in this effort. Yeah. Been a long uh, road to where we are today, and uh, but uh, one one question that came to my mind when I was listening to your presentation here: if if we can proceed down the road of trying to seek a uh, collaborative uh, agreement, and based on your experience in working with these kind of complex problems, what kind of a time frame would you estimate uh, it would take us? People always want to know the answer to couple that. Couple weeks, <laughs> and here's the couple other, weeks maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and, and here's the other thing that they always uh, that we often hear is that well we don't have time, that would just take too much time. And and my answer is always it it does take time to to do a collaborative process correctly. Um, you need to you need to design a good process. You need to establish a common and shared information base. It, it is essential to start with establishing a shared vision for what a desired future looks like. You need to figure out what, uh, how you're going to make decisions and if that's by consensus what that means to you. Um, because <clears throat> there's lots of different definitions and sometimes people get wrapped around the axle because they just all make their assumption of what consensus means and then they get to the end and they have different ideas. Um, so, so there's all these steps and, um, and so that does take some time. Oh, <clears throat> I should have mentioned establishing trust and relationships among the group. Um, you, you know you're there when people start laughing at each other's jokes. Uh, and, you know, that can take a while. We're all laughing. Right, you're all laughing. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Um, but uh, then I always ask them, and how long is it taking to do it the other way? <laughs> right? Yeah. So um, it, it doesn't take more time, it, it, but it does take time. Uh, and and we'll have a, we have a colleague who always likes to say, and you've probably heard this, fast, cheap, and good, pick two. Right? You, you, can't, you can't have all three. Um, so how long it will take would really depend on the amount of issues you're trying to address. Uh, you, know, you, you end up taking a guess and establishing a process. The best processes kind of um, ha happen along the pace they need to. Uh, sometimes things can happen quickly, but you know, even this assessment, which was just the first phase of a potential collaborative process, was six months, and that was not... That was that was about right. You know, so okay. they can take some time. Yeah. And I uh, I skipped over, uh, and so I'm going to go back, and then I'll get the last person that signed to testify and ask if anybody else wishes to do so. Um, but I should have asked uh, the director Lou and Navani uh, Shield with the Department of Enterprise Services if they uh, for their uh, closing comments on the report, and I forgot to do that. So is that you or the director? I'll start off. Bonnie. Just real briefly, thank you, first of all, Chris, Christina, and Michael for your presentation. Uh, these recommendations are going to help Department of Enterprise Services and the legislature understand what's needed to continue moving ahead toward a long-term vision for capital. Enterprise Services has not requested funds for a dredge at this point, as we do not want to jeopardize the collaborative process that we were pursuing through the Ruckles House Center. Enterprise Services has requested $350,000 for the 2015-2017 biennium to pursue any recommendations that come from this report and could later work with the legislature on a 2016 supplemental request should that be needed. Uh, again, we want to mention the final report will be available on the Enterprise Services website when it's completed next week, and we look forward to working with both committees on next steps. And Chris, come on. I want to thank the Ruckelhaus Center for the work they've done. It's been just absolutely outstanding. I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, Representative uh, Kaiser uh, for all the work that she's, she's done uh, in suggesting uh, that we use the Ruckelhaus. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Fraser. 
to, uh, to, uh, to okay, I'm going to fire myself. <laughs> <laughs> For to, to make sure that we do have a, a good process in, in place. So thank you for being here. Thank you for doing all the, the heavy work and the heavy lifting. Uh, I can say for the agency and, and for the governor that we are not interested in uh, delaying anything. We want to move the ball. Uh, we realize that this has been a long-standing uh, opportunity for the community. And we want to make sure that we have community input to whatever solution that happens uh, for for Capital Lake and for the, the for the, uh, the solution. So uh, I want I want to say that, that we want to continue the process. So um, I think anything else I would major myself. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it that. Thank okay. you. So we have uh, one other person that's asked um, Dave Peeler. If you would just state, um, for the record, your name and who you were, if you are representing a, a group, that, that would be helpful. You bet. Uh, my name is Dave Peeler. I'm the president of the Sioux Chathaway Restoration Team Board and uh, recovering and retired state employee <laughs> who worked for one of the agencies involved in the, in the water quality studies that are underway. And I would just like to echo the comments made by others that I think that the work done by Arkansas Center has been really good. Uh, when I was one of the interviewees, as you will see on the list, as many of you were, and I was impressed that the questions were open-ended, and they gave us an opportunity to add anything we thought might be important or raise other issues, which I think is important to be able to flesh out the full range of <coughs> issues that people might be concerned about. Uh, having said that, <coughs> I, I was impressed, really, also, that we actually, it was the first opportunity since the clamp was disbanded to have anybody sort of look at these questions and try to think about how would you actually push the process forward. And I think that's been something that the agencies and DES have been struggling with. Uh, so this might be a way to sort of put some bounds on how we could move ahead. Uh, as far as timing goes, <clears throat> the Department of Ecology, which is doing the water quality studies, has still not completed those. And they've been very open to, to reviews of their information. In fact, they're collecting quite a bit more data on some of the sediment issues out of the butt inlet uh, now. Uh, because of questions that were raised about some of the modeling and impacts of entities outside of but i.e. farther to the north on the water quality issues down here so that, those studies won't be completed probably for another year or so so uh, to our organization i have uh, quite up front delays have been beneficial in that we want to see that work completed so there's a good strong base of scientific information on which to base the decisions uh, that doesn't mean that other work couldn't go ahead in the meantime, look at some of the other issues or that some of the scientific questions that have been raised couldn't be added to the work that needs to be done in the next year or so. So uh, we're hopeful that those things can come together and we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. So I didn't have anybody else signed up that said they wish to testify. We have a couple minutes. Is there anybody that had a question or wishes to make comments? If so, or forever hold, no, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you very much for the presentation. Any other comments, Mr. Director? No, no further comments. Okay. I would just like to add my thanks to others. I know this has been a, uh, a big project for the center, and uh, as a member of this committee and, and as an elected official, I really appreciate your, your diligence and in bringing this information forward so that we can move the process ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having thanks. us. Yeah, you good <laughs> <laughs>